Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very fascinating one for the first quarter of 2016. It's a series about the Great Controversy. The title is Rede Rebellion and Redemption which is, sounds like a beginning and an end of the sin problem. I certainly hope so. Um, and this is lesson number seven in that series, entitled, as I'm going to entitle it, and I have to tell you that I um, added something to the title here, if you don't mind, Jesus' Life, Teachings, and Death in Light of the Great Controversy. This is our lesson for February 13 of 2016. We'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray together. Our wonderful Father, we can't even begin to imagine the sacrifice you made when you sent your son here on that expensive and dangerous trip to try to convince us, as stubborn and egotistical and selfish and sinful as we are, that um, we need to come back to you. May this lesson be a bit of an insight onto some of the things that we need to learn and that process is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Why did Jesus come to this earth? Many Christians would say, well, he, he came here to die. If he just came to die, he could have died at age one, right? Well, we want him to be here a little bit longer than that because we wouldn't get much of a chance to learn anything about him if he died at age one. Well, what? how do his teachings and the statements he made during his ministry, how do they impact our understanding of the great controversy? We have suggested in our discussions here before that the great controversy clearly isn't a, ba a physical battle. We don't have guns and aircraft and battleships and so forth. This is, a, this is a controversy, a battle that takes place, a war that takes place in the minds of human beings, men and women, on a daily basis. It's happening in your mind right now. So how does that actually work in our experience? Does anything, and here's a question that we need to uh, talk to our Christian friends about, does anything that we can say or do impact the great controversy and the outcome of the great controversy in any way? Let me put that question to you. Does anything we can say or do? Our whole lives. Our whole life, whole experience on this earth but is. But God is sovereign. He's way up there. He has a plan. How do, how do you have anything to do with that? We're all God's kids, and we yeah. have things to learn, and uh, we're not born with those th uh, that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Life is still for learning from the what master do you teacher. Mean by impact? Make, does it make any difference? Does it make any difference? Does it put a dent in his fender or <laughs> whatever, you know? In, in, a, in a way, it, God really doesn't need us, but there does seem to be um, some part we have to play in all mm -hmm. of this. That it, in a way, it's kind of, some of it seems like it's kind of dependent on us to, uh, it seems like it's our job to to make contact with other human beings, uh, to be the witness or, or whatever it is. But uh, you, you I'm, un like I'm uncomfortable saying that the God is dependent on us, but it sure seems to me, and I can't define it clearly, I could just, it's kind of like a little window I can kind of see through. It seems like there's something that's, uh, that is important that I'm, I'm involved here. If it wasn't for us though, would there even be a point for a great controversy? Well, the war started before we ever came around. Right. No, I'm talking about we as in creatures, all the creatures. Okay, if you're talking about all creatures, and that, that, Here. that's a point that, that many of our Christian friends will not recognize, so let's spell it out clearly. The great controversy in many people's minds, without the background that Seventh-day Adventists have been helped into, is a war between the good and the bad. And generally, they, a lot of people think that's a war between God and human beings. There's actually books been written about that. The great controversy is between God and human beings. <clears throat> we see things very differently. We believe that there's a third kind of being that 
is not human and is not God. We call them angels. We call them creatures in the other part, rest of the universe, whatever you choose to call them. Messengers sometimes in, in, the, in the God's uh, work. But 1 Corinthians 4 and 9 tells us that we are the theater of the universe. Now, what's the purpose of the theater? Tell stories. Act out. But it's, you're still telling a story. Okay, but the purpose of a stage and so forth is for everybody else to be watching. And who's doing the watching? The universe. A lot of that we don't understand until and we get there, but they're watching so what if, happens. It, so, Jay, if we weren't here, who would be on the stage? Somebody else, I guess. Somebody else? <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, the question is, does it matter what they think about God? Sure. Yes. Now, Revelation 12 suggests that a third of the angels joined Satan when he rebelled in heaven. Meaning that how many are left over? Two-thirds. Still left in heaven? Did they have any questions? I mean, if a third were so convinced by the devil's arguments that they joined his side in the war against God, the others must have had some questions too. Who's going to answer those questions? This, well, that's a, this is a very unusual teaching. Yeah, well, is that... We're going to, we're going that, to show you that it's this... Is that, is that there are other... That, for, first of all, that people would have questions after, this, after Satan and so forth that, that other, other of God's creatures throughout the universe that he has created, all of a sudden, it's not doubt, but they, there's some wonderment there, mm -hmm. some puzzlement. Uh. So I present the scriptures, okay? Ephesians 1, we're going to read from verses partway through verse 8 through verse 10. And all his wisdom and insight, I'm reading from my Good News Bible, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan. So God has a plan, okay? It's a secret plan. Many people haven't recognized it. He had already decided to, um, hold on here, we got a little, to um, complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. So how much, in, how many, how much of the universe is involved? The entire universe. All of us. Heaven and earth. And then we come to Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret. We talked about the secret plan. Here's his secret again. Hidden through all the past ages. In order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Okay? The rulers and powers in the heavenly world. Hmm. What does that mean? We go to so Colossians. They are learning from the other beings and other, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world are learning from us. That's what, that's what God church. says. That's what he wants to have happen. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. So he wants you to, if you read the earlier section there, if we had time, Clearly, he wants to point out that Jesus was fully God. Then he says, through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood, that is his death, on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. So that would suggest that this battle between good and bad, as some people would suggest it, is much bigger than just what's happening on this earth. However, we recognize in light of what the scripture teaches that we are the one sinful spot. So we're the one bad spot in the universe. So the rest of the universe presumably is still on God's side, but we're the bad spot. So now, you, you're pre, presupposing something by calling it the bad spot. Okay. Don't you think? Well, let me ask you a question in light of that. How many people do you know who are not sinners? Not sinners. Yeah. Well, how do you... Doesn't that pretty much how make many us people, the bad spot? How many people are not sinners? That's my, that was my question to you. Well, how many if we're all sinners here, then this has to be the bad spot. <laughs> 
then this has to be the bad spot. Yeah. So if the bad spot is here, then what's the purpose of even having a bad spot when there's no bad spot anywhere else? That's that's part of the questions First we have to deal with. Yeah. This Earth is the theater stage. It's important to for see the looking God's universe. I know, but all you need is just to get rid of the theater, then you don't have it anymore. Well, because then you lose your freedom. No, 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 no. He could have. If you say that the world is the only bad spot, mm -hmm. well, then why even create it and make it into a theater? Uh, lots of people raise that question. We're going to see if we can it's answer. It's because it. the bad spot is not just on the earth. It was it was in heaven also. So it started. It started there. there. That That's right. And they're all gone. It's so all it's, gone now. Jesus. So so everything's fine in heaven, but it isn't here. Yeah, pretty much. Jesus says he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, and and uh, Revelation twelve nine, this earth, uh, the. the devil and Satan was cast out to this earth, the deceiver of the whole world. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's pretty much... So he took all the bad combined. from up there, put them all together, and threw them down on the earth. No, I think... Well, they excluded, they, ex they were excluded from heaven, and then they tried to go elsewhere, and those other places said, we don't want anything to do with you. And because God created a new earth here, Satan came, and he, he said, let me see what I can do with these new creatures, and we agreed his, to join his side. Voluntarily, we chose his side. That became his headquarters, because we're the only ones who agree with him. We're the only ones who agree with him. I, I've had but a question. some people have questions. We, all, we better have, all of us better have questions. No, the, the angels all have questions. Yes, and there was the so answer. they haven't really been won over completely. And I can show quotations to prove that that's true. Yeah, uh, I know, but 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 uh, you said that they've they've so made a saying, choice. So you're saying that if that exists, then that's that that's part of the badness, and the badness isn't just here. The badness would be elsewhere. Yeah, that's kind of how it's a little weak what I'm saying. Okay, Gordon, we're going to. So there is God's side, mm -hmm. pure good. Mm -hmm. There is Satan's side, pure evil. And there's a lot of, you know, the heavenly universe, the rest of the beings, used to be in the middle, mm -hmm. undecided. Most of them have gone to God's side, but there's still us on this planet Earth that are, and most God, of us are undecided where we're going. God believes that we need to be given a fair opportunity to see the evidence on both sides before we make our choice, and that's where we are. And the so, universe is watching us make yeah. that choice. Is the plan of salvation first and foremost about how Jesus paid the price for our sins and thus can save human beings? Or is there a larger purpose? Could the plan of salvation have anything to do with refuting Satan's charges against God and proving what the true nature and results of sin are? How does the salvation of humankind fit into that? Do we need to understand what the issues were from the beginning of the great controversy in heaven? What accusations has Satan made against God, and how has God responded? So those are the kind of questions we want to, to try to address here. I will now turn to some quotations from Ellen White. These aren't so widely published. Some of them are, but others aren't about that very, some of those points. She says, this is Signs of the Times. She wrote this in February 13, 1893, while she was working on Desire of Ages. Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. So there's a bigger plan. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe, so we can learn to understand that God is good. The charge of, charges of Satan or the charge of Satan refuted. The nature and result of sin made plain, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. How does that sound? Well, Jesus said something along those lines himself, John 12, 30 to 32. But Jesus said to them, it was not for my sake that this voice has spoken. Remember, a voice spoke out of the heavens. But for yours, now is the time for this world to be judged. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. Who would that be? When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. Now, what do those expressions mean? Everyone means not just human beings, it means all intelligent creatures. Yeah. 
Okay. How would you support that from other writings? Well, we've read uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. And uh, he, his death was to bring peace to the beings in the heavenly yeah. places. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty plain, but most religions don't, don't understand that. And very few Seventh-day Adventists understand it. Does, does, does God need to be justified? To most Christians, that sounds like a, some kind of a heresy. He demonstrates. That's how he shows that he's righteous. Is Clause. God on trial? Of course. Romans 3, 4. In what sense? He's been maligned. His character has been uh, well, maligned. Let's look at the quotation, Romans 3, 4. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. So even if he had to lose all of us, not one of us could be saved. God must be proven true. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Talking about God. Clearly, go back there and look at it. It's talking about God. So God has a case in court. What kind of a case is that? He's been accused of being arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacting, severe, tyrannical, despotic. And how does he, how does he uh, counter those uh, charges? Just a denial on God's part will not settle it in the minds of intelligent creatures. He has to demonstrate it. And the ultimate demonstration was about 2,000 years ago. The devil said in the form of the serpent in Genesis 3, God is a liar. Mm -hmm. And God has spent this whole time trying to refute that to the satisfaction of all the beings of the universe. Ellen White, when talking about how that first sin occurred in the Garden of Eden, Patriarchs of Prophets 68 and 69 said, but the plan of redemption, now who needs to be redeemed? We do. Had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Broader, deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. It was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. So who's watching? Everybody. The whole, the whole universe. universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now some people think that she misquoted scripture there. She left out all men. Men is not there. If you look in your King James Bible, it's in italics. Italics in the King James mean it's not there. The original translators s supplied it because they thought that's what applied. No, she says it will draw everyone. And how do I know that? Look what she says next. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son and their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. God needs to be justified. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. How does God become justified? He has to be, justified like, means to be shown to be right. Shown to be right. He, we, he has to what, prove what that. What is the question that, that is Satan, right saying, in the garden. Yeah. What, what is the question that, that he has to be right on? Very simple. In the Garden of Eden, God said, if you sin, you will die. And Satan's immediate response is, that's a lie. So who's telling us the truth? You shall die. Hmm? But sin leads to death. that the question? No, he uh, makes a people, statement. When he, people die, why is it that people have to die? The, the, issue, the, issue, the issue is a matter of trust. That's the issue. Yeah. Who, who, but still, are you going to trust God? But That's still, why do people have to die? Because they're sinners. Why do sinners have to die? Sin because they sin. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm I'm getting all those words from you, but I need to understand it. Why? Well, I don't know what you accept. It's a natural can, consequence. Can I read? God a, is a life source, and when you separate yourself from that life source, you die. Look at Isaiah fifty-nine two. 
It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. And God is the only source of life. So if you're separating yourself from God, what happens? You die. That's actually what sin is. When you sin, you are doing things which separate yourself. From but isn't Satan separated from God right now? So God well, is artificially keeping him going. Well, okay, if you're going to say that, that means he can, say he, can he can make everybody artificially. That's right. Stay. But how? So if he, he pulls that artificial back, right. then he's making that decision to do that. And then the no question comes, why do you have to do that? Why do you have to pull back? Why do you have to pull back? Stop oh, sustaining it, evil. Oh, yeah. Who's keeping evil going? Yeah. Why does By God definition. have to pull back? Why does he have to pull away well, from if he's artificially keeping us alive, yeah. That means being separated from him isn't true, that you die, because he can artificially come in and fix it. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, like, it's like I can keep someone alive by breathing in their mouth, but how long are you going to do that? Why not forever? Why? Why? Why forever? That's, that's why it's taking I'm, so I'm long. I'm asking the questions. <laughs> you're just saying why. You're, you're coming back to me with the same question. I want an answer. Okay. So why doesn't God keep doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation forever? He wants a There's no freedom. To the it, you, it, if he's doing life support on you, you don't have freedom. That's a stopgap. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, you that have, has nothing to do with freedom or not. Absolutely, that the whole thing he, has to do with freedom. All he has to do is keep you alive. That, that isn't that living. Isn't, living living on life way. support is not let, living. Let, let put it, there's another way we can view it. God could save everybody. That's what you're talking about. God could save everybody. He could take us all to heaven. All he would have to do is make heaven into one giant prison. We all would be in. Are all you would be worried in, 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 about that? I'm that absolutely so. worried about that. So do I want to live next bit, door? Isn't that a little bit selfish on your part? No. Why? I I, be, I don't want to live next isn't door. Isn't that kind of like having some keeping guys out of your neighborhood because you don't want them there? Oh, it no. Would, it means it means it means there would I mean look around the world. Do you do you want to live in what we have right now for the rest of eternity? Answer the question. Would I? Yeah. It depends. If I, I mean, you, you uh, like people no. shooting each other, you like wars going on, you think it's wonderful for millions of people. Well, if people shoot each people. other and God can keep them alive, well, what's, the use of, what's the use of shooting yeah. everybody because There's they're all freedom. still alive? God wants you to have freedom to choose and make decisions without no, coercion. or I why people have to die. That's okay. my question. Well, just, by coming to dwell dead. with us, Okay. <laughs> sin pays its way. All right. Okay. I'll, which, I'll which just death, The first it. death or the second death. Yeah. For all death, why is it that they have to die? Well, that's, that's our our, because our genetic code has degenerated so much that, yeah. that we have well, disease. That would and, be the first uh, death still. Yeah, that's the, the first death. The our second death happens because we're separated from God. Yeah. He's the only source of life. If we're separated, Jesus died on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was, that's, so the question is, Finally, God has to say, well, if you really don't want to have anything to do with me, you really want to stay separate from me, you're really determined to stay in your sins, there's really nothing more I can do for you. I have to let you go. That's it. They, you, you, you choose to die at that point. Mm -hmm. Because you, you choose, you don't want anything now to that, do with Now, that's me. a good answer there. Because I'm, I'm seeing you choosing to, yeah. to die, that's not hard. have God... Make the decision. He would love for you, even to live though forever. that you want to live. Well, ultimately, God will if honor you're in choice. line with Him. <coughs> Hosea four seven is probably the verse that you're looking for. The people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. Four seventeen. Four seventeen. Did I say seven? Sorry, That's four seven. Hosea seven. In the world today. Well, we've got a lot of things still to talk about. We've got a, some really important issues. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, 1 Peter 1.12. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. Desire of Ages 19, paragraph 2. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, It is finished had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us. 
that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Not until the death of Christ, this is part of your questions, not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The archapostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Zara of Ages 758, paragraph 3. And you, to fill out that picture, you need to read the chapter it is finished in Desire of Ages. Did Satan have access to the rest of the universe while he was allowed in heaven, or he yes. never got there? He did. He did. Yeah, and Ellen White saw a vision of, of other places, and they, she asked her, well, did you have a tree of knowledge of good and evil? Yeah, it was here for a while. We rejected it. We, we got rid of it. Now, that, that's fine for Mrs. White. Now, I'm not against it. I don't misunderstand. Yeah. Is there a Bible text that t lets you know that? We know there was war in no, heaven. We not, know he got kicked out. Not in so many words, no. Yeah, okay. But here's one. The security of the universe was even more important to God than the salvation of man. And I'm quoting, and this is one you certainly will not find in other places. This is found in uh, Signs of the Times, July 12, 1899. This is stuff that was written by Ellen White and published, and nobody else has figured out what to do with it. It was in order that it, the heaven... It might be good to tell people that this information is all available on theox.org website yes. under Sabbath School. Yes. Under the Sabbath School lesson. Yeah. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption, that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. They wanted to see, okay, what are the, what are the conditions under which God can continue to keep us alive, continue to live with us, and it, it's not under Satan's conditions, I can assure you. She goes on, and this is an incredible sentence, the throne of justice, that would be God's seat, must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the race, who would that be? Human race. The entire human race be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. Now, that's just her words explaining Romans 3, 4, because that's exactly what that says. Every man, God must be true even though every man is a liar, right there in Romans 3, 4. Mm -hmm. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled and the human race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government, Romans 3, 4. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. In other words, what? What is, he, what is she saying there? <coughs> Everybody realizes. All the answers have been given. Look, look at this. This is another part of this same thing is uh, Ephesians, I'm sorry, Philippians 2, um, talking about how Jesus came to be a human being. He appeared in human likeness. Verse 8, he was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below, will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And who does that include? Satan. Satan himself will be down on his knees saying, yes, God, you did it right. But he will still be rebellious. He will still be a rebel. Will live with God. Yeah. I'm going to read one or two more. These are from Ellen White. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. What would that mean? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. Colossians 1, 19 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. In other words, basically they learned about the results of death. They learned about who's telling us the truth from the life and death of Jesus. And how God, Evil God is involved in that. Yeah. Okay? It, it, it wasn't God doing something arbitrary. Sin run its course, you die. Yeah. Sin it is, pays its wage, not God. God doesn't need to make sin any worse yeah. by doing something to you. Yeah. 
So when they, when they look and they see what God, what Jesus did there, how is that impacting them? What, what, is, what is stimulating them to, what thoughts are going through their mind? They're, well, see, they're, they are convicted because okay, here's, here's the he demonstrated yeah. what? Well, we look at the cross. We look at, at Gethsemane. We look at the cross and we say, yeah, Jesus, something happened to him there in the garden. He was sweating drops of blood. That looks pretty serious. Then later we see him dying on the cross. Yeah, crucifixion isn't very much fun. But the universe was watching. They saw Jesus, and Ellen White says, he fell dying to the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane before a single person had laid a hand on him. He hadn't been tortured yet. He hadn't, didn't have a crown of thorns, nothing. He fell dying to the ground. The universe watched Satan and God, the two sides there, dealing with Christ and watching God step back and let Satan have full access to him in the Garden of Eden, and it killed him. He had to send an angel to resuscitate him, basically. He went out to the, gar went out to the, the Calvary through the, all those terrible trials and all that kind of stuff and did the whole thing over again so we would see that sin leads to death. Jesus didn't die of crucifixion. He died of sin. And the universe looking on saw it, and they understood what was going on. We still don't understand what was going on. <coughs> Most Bible translations have it wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. The plan of salvation making manifest the justice and love of God, so it makes manifest the justice, the rightness, and the love of God, provides an eternal safeguard. How long is this safeguard good for? Forever. Forever. Against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889. And you can also find it in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1132, paragraphs 8 and 9. Have we been told exactly why Jesus came? By whom have we been told? Well, Jesus. Not uh, by most people. Not by John most seventeen uh, three and four. He yeah. says. Well, he says why he came. He says uh, to demonstrate your character and yeah. show that your, God is righteous. Well, Ellen White spells this out, and and unfortunately, almost no one has has, has taken advantage of this. Really looked at it. This is found in Signs of the Times, January twenty eighteen ninety. Jesus came to teach men of the Father. What did he come for? To teach. To correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who is a living impersonation of God, uh, could not fail to accomplish the work. <clears throat> the only way, this is incredible, the only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. So how does he, to set men right, what's another word for that? Justify. Justify. What's another word for keeping people right? Sanctify. Sanctify, yeah. So the only way he could justify and sanctify human beings was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth, to set men right through the revelation of God. The only way, the whole purpose. And Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And of course, that's your John uh, 17 in his prayer. He hasn't died yet. Hasn't died yet. So that if, if Jesus is the only way that that, um, that knowledge can be observed, then it can't be observed in me. Well, no, no, that's not true. You just can't do it perfectly. God wants as many, much help as he can possibly get. He, he would, he, you know, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Heaven. Your Father, which is in heaven. But if an angel can't, if Jesus had to come because even an angel That's couldn't right. do that, then, you're, you're then gonna, an angel couldn't do it perfectly You're going to be a candle. You're not going to be the sun. 
Hmm. What gets set right? You're thinking about God, yeah. how you think about God. You're thinking about God? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, you're, where's the point where you that thinking is, is enough? Never stops. Can, it'll never stop. Never stop. No. Through eternity. So... You can reject you it, set, in which it'll case it'll When you stop. set that right, that means it was wrong before. Mm -hmm. uh, misunderstanding about God, that's correct. So we don't have any misunderstandings now? We need to be correcting... Evidently you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When I just the, I pass have, that up. I have misunderstandings <laughs> about God. Uh, well, yes. We all do. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what the... So <laughs> the planet outside our solar system looks like, yeah. let alone what God is like completely. Let me the only thing I know about it is, is what I've seen in Jesus. What he's That's revealed. Shit. When the, the object of, of his mission was attained, what was the object of his mission? The, uh, the revelation of God to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. And in response to what Gary just said, Romans 5.10, mm -hmm. he says, I've studied Jesus. And Romans 5.10, he says, you are healed by Jesus' life. Mm -hmm. and that's, it's that simple, and yet it's yeah, endless. Mm -hmm. I'll read that. Romans 5.10 from my Good News translation. We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends to the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? And saved is healed. Yeah. If, we, if we're sick, we need healing. Mm -hmm. And God says, I'm your healer, Exodus 15, 26. That's a, that's a deep statement. It's there, but I, I don't, I don't, at least right now, I don't follow the, the complete transition of how that okay. happened to me. Okay. Let, 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 let me just say very briefly, and this is not going to be an in-depth, because we don't have the time. <laughs> we look at the life and death of Jesus. We can see how he lived. We can see what he did, how he loved, all the things that he did, and we can say we like that or we don't like that. We can look at his death and we can say, this is what's going to happen to sinners at the end. This is the second death. Very, absolutely awful. Okay, now we have a choice. We can live lives as close as possible to the way Jesus lived, or we will die the way he died. That's the choice. His life and his death make, give us that choice. Is that, uh, that we don't need to make that choice uh, after we've made the choice? Um, let's see, let me, let me, let me. So when, when, when the earth is remade and everything's all new and pretty again, mm -hmm. I don't have to make that choice? Well, yeah. The tendency, in, in, the in tendency to reject the choice will be far diminished, but I can make that choice at You will still time. be free just as Satan was free, Lucifer was free to reject God back in the beginning. Choice is always there. You don't, you don't have there. to. You don't have to do so this, but... The, the choice is death or life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what what is the big thing about that? Why is that such a hard choice? Well, it shouldn't be. But what we see all around us is people are choosing death. Why are they doing that? Some, because they don't understand, seeds. I guess, okay. what they're doing is death. Some, yeah. Something is so, hap when, when When sin happens, something has happened. And everything no. is screwed up. Here's, here's, <laughs> here's part of the problem. The choice, if, you, if I said, okay, you get the choice of living or dying, I mean, how many would choose dying? Very few would choose dying. If I said, okay, the choice is more than that. It's a choice between loving and being selfish. Now, how many are going to choose? Because if you join Satan's side, that's selfishness. I want everything from me. I want to get ahead. I want to beat my enemies down. I want to. I want number one, me, 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 me. That's the way our world works, and that's pure selfishness. That's absolutely satanic. By contrast, God is love. We know the Bible says that several many times. God is love. And he says, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, you need to learn to be loving even to your enemies. And you need to be willing to be loving all the time. And that's not easy for self, you know, naturally selfish human beings. So it's that's, not easy to get into heaven then? Well, it's, 
Well, if it's not, not easy, not, not until and you, you have to not. be that way, well, then it's no. not easy to get into heaven, then. No. It, the Bible says it's a narrow road. It's not the well, broad road. Well, narrow road doesn't mean it's hard. Narrow no, remote he, road means that you can't waver this way or that way. You've got to go straight. Yeah. When, you, when you meet the master, <clears throat> the th things can change. Yeah. Well, if, if, if God says to Ellen White, the only way, the whole purpose of his mission, the object of his mission was attained, his work was accomplished, the character of thought was made manifest. Do those words sound important? What have we usually said was the mission of Christ? What do most Christians say his mission is? To save us, to seek and save the lost. To die, to pay the price of sin. Are we saying that Jesus came here really to live rather than to die? No, he had, he had to show us how to live and then he had to show us what happens if we don't. He had to show both. If we view the great controversy as being limited to this earth, we will be missing what is probably the most important part of God's mystery, His secret plan to correct the misunderstandings in the heavenly universe. If necessary, God would have wiped out the entire human race in order to accomplish this larger goal. He almost did wipe out the entire human race at the time of the flood. In there. Is this plan really a big secret, or is Paul using the term secret as kind of a hook to catch, <laughs> catch, people's, catch people's attention? Well, part of it you need to understand that in Paul's day there were these called so-called mystery religions. And that's what, this is the word here, mystery. Mm -hmm. see? And these mystery religions would go around and say, you don't know what I know. You know. I'm better than you because I know the secret. And so Paul kind of tongue-in-cheek says, we have a real secret, I'm telling everybody. So he's, he's making fun of mystery religions. Because it bothers me that this would be a, that God would, I don't know, somehow. Try to hide things. And, and my understanding is it isn't a secret. You go, you go back to the Old Testament. I mean, that's what, that's what would be inferred here by many people. Back in the Old Testament, it was a big secret. But now it's, it's revealed yeah. when, it's my understanding, it, it, was, uh, it was illuminated there. Certainly not as well as when Jesus came, but, you know, it was... The information was there too. Well, if you don't understand it, isn't that a secret? That's doesn't that true. turn mm -hmm. into a secret anyway? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the angels are watching every move that God makes and every move that Satan and his angels make. And they are the ones who really understand the great controversy at this point in history. When we get to heaven, we will be able to see all the details that we do not presently understand. Notice that it was God, his angels, the heavenly universe, and Satan and his angels who really saw what was happening at the cross, not us. It is time for us as the Seventh-day Adventist Christians to follow the leading of the Bible writers in Ellen White and rise above our egocentric approach to the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is much more than God, how, how God saves me and, and, and you too, of course. If God cannot be proven to be trustworthy, something which Satan has denied, then there can be no basis for our faith and the plan of salvation has failed. And you know, that's, that's really what is happening when we, when we depart from what God would have us do. It's a matter of trust. If I decide, well, I need my tithe more than... It, it's a matter of trust there. You're yeah. going to keep this because you don't trust God to, to take care of you if, you if you provide that tithe as he's asked you to do. Does all that worry you? In light of all these... Go ahead. <laughs> what part? Any of it. In light of all those enormous issues, what was Jesus trying to tell us when he said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke <clears throat> and put it on you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will find rest. What's the yoke of Christ? What are yokes used for? Control. Yeah. Control, well, to do work. To mostly, share the huh? work. Share to share the, the if work, If you have yeah. cooperative, willing oxen, it's not, it's not <laughs> control. Just keeps them working together. Well, who's on the other side of the yoke? Is it Jesus? You asked yourself that question? 
So why are you taking the metaphor that way? <laughs> I'm asking because it doesn't it doesn't say that in the Bible. Well, he says take my yes, it does. No, it says take my yoke, but it doesn't tell about him walking behind the yoke. No, it talk. He says, "I have a yoke. I want you to be the other part of it." Ah, okay. Is that what? So it you've got yes. a, You've got an oak here. Uh, you got yoke a yoke here, here for two creatures. For two creatures, he's in one side. He says, and you're in "My the yoke. Other. I have. This is my yoke. Do you want to take the other half of it?" I'll pull you along. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drag you in directions you don't want to go. Well, I'll help and, you. And the, I'll see, you. The, well, pull you along, but, but that's not so far off. I mean, we joke about it, but he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you'll find what? Rest. <clears throat> Yokes aren't for resting, they're for working. Right? He's taking the so, bulk of the load. Well, he's taken more than the bulk of the load. So, how many places in Scripture have we have the has, does the Bible talk about really major rests of various kinds? You know, that's not the image we have of the yoke. We, we I'm telling we, you, we, we <coughs> our image of the yoke is we put this thing on and we struggle along with and it. We're right? yanking around on the thing. I mean, do I need to read it to his, you again? His, his yoke is is all these bad things he went through, and now we're going to take it, and we're going to suffer like that too. That's our perception of that yoke, the natural inclination for this. Matthew eleven twenty nine. take my yoke and put it on you. Okay? I mean, I don't know how to make it any clearer than that. Well, but can, can you think of other kinds of rest, other times when Jesus called us to rest in the Bible? He rested after creation, Genesis 2, 2. Can you think of another time? The Sabbaths, right, are supposed to be a rest. The annual feasts that the Jews were supposed to practice were times of rest. The seventh year of rest for the land, we don't talk about that very much, but every seventh year they were supposed to not, not, not cultivate their fields, just leave them. Why, why did they need to do that? <coughs> kind of rotation of the crops. Yeah? Well, it's not like they just didn't plant anything that year. They kind of... If they had a field, then they divided it up into sections. You think they had to rotate? Well, that's what I kind of thought. I didn't think they just didn't grow anything then. Yeah. Well, even in the so. Jubilee year, every 50 years, when slaves were freed and debt forgiven, <clears throat> the yoke is placed, and now I'm reading from Desire of Ages, the yoke is placed upon the oxen to aid them in drawing the load to lighten the burden. So with the yoke of Christ, when our will is swallowed up in the will of God, so who's working together here? us and God. And we use his gifts to bless others. We shall find life's burden light. He who walks in the way of God's commandments is walking in company with Christ. And in his love, the heart is at rest. Desire of Ages 331. If you're wearing a yoke and you're walking in company with Christ, who's in the other half? Yes. <laughs> and it seems pretty clear to me. This is the problem. Gary, you asked about the problem. It is more palatable to human nature, these are selfish human beings, to do penance than to renounce sin. It is easier to mortify the flesh by sackcloth and nettles and galling chains than to cru crucify fleshly lusts. Heaven is a yoke which the carnal heart is willing to bear. Heavy, I'm sorry. Heavy is the yoke which the carnal heart is willing to bear rather than bow to the yoke of Christ. Great Controversy 567, paragraph 3. What does that tell you? I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> the, the metaphors there are, are a little bit confusing to me. They are? Uh, yeah, because uh, like, he, like Jay said, a, a yoke is for, for work, and yet yeah. you put the yoke on and then you, then you have rest. So, okay, there's so, something there I'm not getting. Instead of so, you doing all the work of pulling whatever, Jesus is there, God is there next to you, helping you. That's, that's the metaphor. It's yeah, a, but it says to put on his yoke, mm -hmm. not, not another that's yoke right. that's going to be yours. No, it's, so, it's, and it's a two-hole yoke. It's in combination with him. It's, it's the yoke has, has room for two, yeah. two oxen. That's He's on one side and you're on the it's other. It's always yeah. used with two. If, no, it isn't always easy to do. Yeah, wait a minute. A, a heavy horse 
they have a color. There's a difference. A yoke is a two, yeah, two but animal. But these are for um, oxen. For ox. But they're always yes. two. There's, There's always, always two. Always. Pretty two. much always two. I you look don't at some know. of the old pictures of heavy draft horses. They've always got a collar. Now they're linked to a neighbor, and there's chains behind. Well, I can see horses, but oxen, they, they, their minds are a little different than horses. That's why it's better to have two. Two. They stabilize each other out, exactly. and they can pull. There's well, a lot of people that only had, could afford one. I that's don't know. Why the, that's why the yoke is not a very flattering. <laughs> I, would, I would encourage you, <coughs> if you are interested in the discussion and some of the stuff that's going on there, to go to our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and look this stuff up and think about it yourself. But rest really isn't possible when you're facing violent enemies. Ken, let me, yeah. you, you mentioned the website there and you just kind of slip over it. I, and we talk about it from time to time. Um, I mentioned here, and I think our viewers ought to know this. That a couple of weeks ago in the Sabbath school lesson where, I, my Sabbath school class where I go, there was a, there was a well-known Adventist preacher. Everyone would know this preacher. Mm -hmm. And at the end of his presentation, he said, if you want some of the best materials on to study the Sabbath school, theox.org is, is the place to get them. Mm -hmm. So you kind of slip over that, you're kind of modest about that. But I think our viewers ought to, ought to know that. Okay. That, that uh, this man said that thing. Yeah. These, are, these are good things. Okay. I encourage you to look at our site. <clears throat> Revelation 14, 9 to 11 is called the third angel's message. Is there any rest in the third angel's message? It's a warning. Let's read it. A desperate warning. A desperate warning, Gordon says. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief or rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast or its image, for anyone has the mark of its name. Is that pretty clear? Sounds like a lot of rest to me. <laughs> in the flames, or what kind of rest did you have in mind? <coughs> I was being a little suspicious. Well, so this third angel's message, we don't have time to talk about it in le at length here, is God's response to what happened in the previous chapter, Revelation 13, 15 to 17, where Satan says, if you don't join my side, you won't be able to eat or drink, because I will make it impossible for you to buy and sell. So now what? Which is worse, God's threat or Satan's threat? Or are they threats? Well, while you're thinking about that, what is the ultimate source of peace and rest for God's people? If God himself were arbitrary, exacting, a severe tyrant, unforgiving and judgmental, would there ever be a time for rest? You'd be scared to death every moment. What's God going to do to me next, right? If you, if you walked down the golden streets in heaven and you saw God coming, you'd go around the block, right? I mean, you know, think about it. Rest comes with the assurance that God has told us the truth about sin, righteousness, and Satan, and that he can, God himself can be trusted. There's no need to be afraid of him. In fact, he wants us to be his friends, John 15, 15. I don't know how to make it any clearer than that. Everything that Jesus did and said was in light of the larger great controversy issues. Um, Matthew 13, 3 to 8, we don't really have time to read all that. Talked about the sower who went out to sow and some of his seed went in different places. You know the story. How does this parable relate to our understanding of the great controversy? Shouldn't God have known where the good soil was and just not waste his seed on those bad spots? I mean, God ought to be able to do that, right? Parallel to that would be the sunshine and the rain falls on the yeah. good and the bad alike. Yeah. And what did God say in another parable about letting the wheat grow up with the tares? 
you, you, you know, they get the sunshine, they get the nourishment from the ground. You don't separate them until when? The harvest. Until the harvest. Until they show their real character. Yeah. Satan and his angels, this is Christ's Object Lessons, page 44, paragraph 3. Satan and his angels are in the assemblies where the gospel is preached. While angels of heaven endeavor to impress hearts with the word of God, the enemy is on the alert to make the word of no effect. With an earnestness equaled only by his malice, he tries to thwart the work of the Son of Spirit of God. While Christ is drawing the soul by his love, Satan tries to turn away the attention of the one who is moved to seek the Savior. Well, think about some of the people who have, may have joined your church in recent years. Can you remember some who seemed, who seem or seem to fit the different types of soil in this parable? Have you met people, do you know people who have just, when they finally found the truth, they just jumped in with both feet and they were so excited about the truth, they were ready to go out and tell everybody. And have, you might have met other people who jumped in, they seemed to be so excited at first and then they grew cold, right? Well, God has a warning for all of us. It's found in Matthew 7, 21 to 27. Let's see if I can get my computer to bring that up here for us. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. You think that could happen to any of us? Surely not, right? Are these words frightening to you? What entered the minds of Jesus' first listeners when he told this parable? What do you think they were talking about? None of them lived anywhere, near, and, and he goes on to talk about the houses that were built on the solid rock and the one that was built on the sand, and none of them lived anywhere close to the ocean. They were talking about living in places and valleys and so forth where flash floods would come zooming down once in a while, and you know what would happen to the houses that were not built on the rock. Well, Jesus talks about judging. We don't have time to, to mention that. He was making two very important points in these verses. Often we are most critical of others and other sins and mistakes when they are committing the same sins which we are guilty of. I hope you've enjoyed this little exposure we've had to some of the deeper parts of the great controversy and I hope you'll think about them very seriously yourself. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of having been exposed to these really important issues in the great controversy. Help us to recognize what Satan is trying to do and teach, and what you, by contrast, are doing and teaching. May we understand it clearly enough so that we will never be deceived, we will never fall for Satan's side, but we will be faithful to your side, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.